Doo-wop legends rise from rags to riches. A major city's fall from grace, and a former president's Oval Office secrets. Tonight, we talk with the biggest authors of 2015, where they find inspiration. I wasn't expecting to write a book about Detroit until Super Bowl Sunday of 2011. How they developed their unique writing style. That's such a great question. I'm not sure anyone's ever asked me that. Here's my dirty little secret. And what it took to get a president to open up. They really do want the record to be clear. Tonight, the personal stories behind their best-selling books. Thank you for having me. I can explain myself. Hi, everyone. I'm John Siegenthaler, and we hope you are enjoying the holidays. Tonight, we have a special edition of our program. Our regular viewers know that most nights we bring you interesting conversations as part of the newscast. Tonight we take a look back at some of our interviews with authors who had the biggest books of the year. We begin with Patricia Cornwell. She's one of the best read authors in the world. She sold more than 100 million books. In her latest novel, Cornwell's famous character, Dr. K. Scarpetta, the medical examiner, is back working on another mysterious crime. I started by asking Patricia how she does her research. I go out and explore. I really am a combination of a journalist and an investigator. And what I do is if I want to learn about a certain type of firearm, I will go to Texas and practice with that gun, whatever it is, using experts to learn about the physics of it or the kinds of weapons being used today. If it's a certain type of case and I need to go to a lab or go to the morgue, or I've seen you know, thousands of autopsies. Did you, you had a fascination with... The, the more the job of a medical examiner? I didn't. I was intrigued because when I was a police reporter at the Charlotte Observer, the medical examiner, when I was covering a homicide, would never answer my phone calls. They were these <laughs> mysterious people like Quasimodo that worked in dark, stinky places, and you never, they didn't call you and you didn't get to go there. So when I decided to write crime fiction, which would have been 1984, to get started in that, I said, I don't know what the medical examiner would do here. I've got to go research this because I didn't get to as a journalist. So I got permission to go to a medical examiner's office. I got a tour. Um, one of the few people who would even want such a thing probably. And then I said, I ain't going anywhere. I want to stay here. I want to learn all this. Would you let, do, let me do anything to just hang out? I want to, I was, they were talking about DNA and lasers and all the labs upstairs. And I thought, wow, this is a universe nobody knows about. So I decided to tackle it. Is true crime stranger than fiction? Yes. True crime is stranger than fiction. True crime is worse than fiction. I've seen things in the real world that I'm not going to write about and tell you because they're too awful. Um, and there are strange things. And some of them are just, you don't want to laugh, but they're sort of, they're so absurd. Um, where, you know, like somebody who leaves a bar drunk and they're hit by a car at 3 o'clock in the morning and their body's at the morgue the next morning. And the state trooper going through the wallet finds a fortune cookie. You will soon have an encounter that will change the course of your life. And you don't know whether to laugh or to cry because someone saved that because it mattered to them. Well, they had an encounter, but not the one they wanted. And so you're looking at each other, and you said, this is an absurd moment. If I put this in a novel, people might not believe it. I've seen the wrong dentures put in the wrong mouth. I've seen glasses end up on a body when they really belong to the medical examiner to put them on a table. I've seen all kinds of weird stuff go on. You, you know, this book reads and it flows so well. And I wondered as I read it, how you write dialogue and, and where does that come from? How does it come so naturally to you? That's such a great question. I'm not sure anyone's ever asked me that. Here's my dirty little secret. I used to travel a lot alone, and I would sit in restaurants with a notebook, and I would eavesdrop on everybody. Really? And I would, not because I cared mm -hmm. about their stories, but their dialogue. Because if you listen to the way people talk, they don't talk in complete sentences. They talk in non sequiturs. Read Hemingway. He has beautiful dialogue. I mean, his dialogue sounds the way people talk. And you have to listen. It's not about constructing sentences. It's about recreating what people do. And then it's believable if you do it. It's also the detail. And the, the, the minute detail that's clear that you know the subject you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, how deep do you go? I go as deep as I need to go. And if, and if there's, um, as long as it's an okay thing, I mean, I don't go around killing people to see what that's like. At least I wouldn't admit to it. Um, but I try to drill into whatever it is, to dig into it, to put on those boots, so to speak. Because when I come back, I'm like the hunter and gatherer. I'm going to bring in my, my booty from what I've done for the day, and then I want you to have the experience. What are your goals in the next 10 years when it comes to, to writing? 
my goal is the last book I write is Scarpetta is going to work a crime scene on the moon. I just don't know if I want to go there, though. I'm kind of scared of thinking of landing on the moon. We don't have a shuttle, but there is the possibility down the road because it's not, I'm not really joking. If you did put astronauts back on the moon mm -hmm. and anybody died up there, someone's going to have to go get them, and that would be our girl, Scarpetta. The interesting thing about talking to you is that you're clearly so passionate about this character. I mean, you lived through her, yes? In a way, I do. I kind of created a friend. You know, I was a lonely little kid when I was growing up. That's why I made up imaginary friends, so I've just done it again. And she's a nice one, and she sends me on missions, only I don't ride a bicycle anymore. It's a great book, Depraved Thank Heart. You. It's great to see you. Thanks for coming It's so coming great by. to see you. Thank you. And now to John Meacham, a Pulitzer Prize-winning author, historian, who's written about presidents like Jefferson and Jackson. His latest biography is about another president, George H.W. Bush. It's called Destiny and Power, the American Odyssey of George Herbert Walker Bush. The former president allowed Meacham exclusive access to his personal taped diaries and other material. I asked him why President Bush decided to go on the record with this book. The reason he cooperated with this, the reason he gave me these diaries, the reason Mrs. Bush gave me her diaries, is they really do want the record to be clear. And he wasn't attacking his son. Uh, he thought his son. Right. He thought his son used rhetoric that was too hot. But but that's a criticism it's of a his criticism. son, it's a, a criticism. of another president of the United States, and his son, right? It is, and it's striking that he articulated it. But I think he'd reached a point where he wanted to make the point for history that diplomacy and force are not competitive but complementary. I really think that's what it was. And the striking thing about this book, I mean, there's so many things that are striking, but the striking thing to me is that the father and son never had this discussion before. No. Is that you, right? I think you and I may have talked about as much at this right. Seriously. Uh, it's, and this is, this is the odd intersection of two forces. One is the senior Bush's reflexive deference to the holder of the office of the presidency, from Lyndon Johnson to Nixon to Ford to Reagan. Whoever was president, Bush thought the duty of a citizen was to do what that president thought was best for that citizen to do. Intersecting with George W. Bush's not particularly welcoming posture for advice. Uh, that's as diplomatically as I can put it. And I think that they talked a lot about family. I think they talked a lot about, hey, ignore the New York Times. Hey, you know, screw CBS News, you know, whatever it would be. He, he, he calls his son out for the rhetoric he used, axis of evil, but in, he talked about evil when he was president, Well, that's right. right. That's right. No, there, there, there was a George Bush who was willing to risk impeachment for going to war against Saddam, and a George Bush who spoke in terms of good versus evil, and that was George Herbert Walker Bush. So, again, the distance is not as great. What's happened, I think, is the passions of the reaction against George W. Bush in his two terms after the uh, glow of 9-11, the patriotic glow of 9-11 faded, the ferocity of that opposition was such that people have looked back on 41 and turned him into this Metternichian diplomat, forgetting the other parts of him, which was that he could be stubborn. He w was determined to go into and free Kuwait almost immediately. You know, he was a, he too had a unilateral streak. But he did produce two sons who were incredible leaders, whether you agree with them or sure. not, in this country. One a president of the United States, another a governor. I, um, how do you, he, he must have said these things to, about uh, George W. Bush and the war and his advisors before Jeb decided to run. Yeah. But he must have also known it could have a big impact on Jeb's political career, right? What he said? You yes. Know, you know, I, I, I still resist that. I'm not, I, maybe I'm just being obtuse. I, I don't see how, Jeb Bush has a problem with someone named Donald, and it's not Rumsfeld. <laughs> uh, you know, I really, I really don't see how, I mean, and there's another line of argument that, well, now Jeb is liberated to pick sides. It's, it's no longer a one Bush view. I just, I, I don't really see that. I think that George H.W. Bush told me some things about, Cheney, about Rumsfeld, about his son, about some disagreements he had. These are big, big boys managing massive world problems at the pinnacle of power. And it's not as though, you know, he said something that a lot of us didn't suspect he really thought. 
And so I don't see how it complicates Jeb's life. I think Jeb has a lot of complications in his life right now, but I don't think his father is complicated. Well, you've got a hit on your hands. It's the talk of the town, this book called Destiny and Power, The American Odyssey of George Herbert Walker Bush. John Meacham, great to see you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. And coming up next on our program. Short shorts don't cause rape. Weed doesn't cause rape. Vodka doesn't cause rape. Rapists cause rape. Aspen Mattis tells us how surviving a brutal crime placed her on the journey of a lifetime. And we revisit the golden days of Detroit with David Marinus. Sunday on Hard Earned, what would you do? The Army is my last resort, but I will do anything necessary for my family. When you're running out of choices. I think I should become a nun. The nuns smoke. And your back's against a wall. I have a problem. I don't speak English. Hard-earned pride. Hard-earned respect. Hard-earned future. A real look at the American dream. Hard-earned. Sunday, 10 Eastern. Only on Al Jazeera America. <laughs> don't miss Hard-earned. Winner of the 2016 Alfred I. DuPont Award. When I lost the job, um, I think that's what really put my credit in the bomb. The way I felt when I got turned down by my bank was embarrassed, a little bit humiliated. I didn't have any bad experiences with credit until I went through a divorce. All of our credit, all of our lives were intertwined. I felt like a failure, what I wasn't able to provide for my family. The car was part of one of the disputes in the divorce, so they took my car one night. Have you been denied credit or are you paying high interest rates because of a low credit score? Join the thousands of people who have relied on creditrepair.com to help rebuild their credit score. One day I seen on TV about credit repair and uh, I called them. And actually it's changed my life. I talked to this lady for like 45 minutes and she was really cool, she was really knowledgeable, she was very professional. For over 15 years we've helped thousands with their search for solutions to credit issues. Call creditrepair.com now for your free consultation. You know, it's funny how a, what a number can do for you. Feel much more confident having a higher higher credit score. Absolutely blow my mind, to be honest with you. I didn't think that they could do what they said they could do until I seen the results. It's like the results matter. Call creditrepair.com now for your free consultation, including a free credit score and free credit report, and see how we can develop a personalized plan to help you. The results are real. The people behind the company are real. It's worth its weight in gold. Thank you, creditrepair.com, for giving me another chance. I feel that I can just take the world off. <laughs> Call 800-841-0044 for your free consultation, including a free credit score and free credit report. That's 800-841-0044. 800-841-0044. And welcome back. I'm John Sigenthaler. Tonight, we continue our look back at some of our conversations with 2015's best-selling authors. Aspen Mattis is a young woman with an incredible story. Her memoir is called Girl in the Woods. It tells how she took a 3,000-mile journey up the Pacific coast in order to reclaim her body and her mind after being raped on the second night of college. I asked her about the challenges she faced reliving that experience in order to write her book. I feel like in a way it was harder um, because I had to not only like re-experience like, you know, the, the smell of, you know, his skin or sort of relive and return to those moments in order to write them effectively, but I also had to make some sense of them. So did you think that if you took this journey, that, it, that your focus on what had happened to you would slip away, that, it, that, it, that, it, that you wouldn't have to concentrate or think about it? It was sort of only after my belief in the infrastructure that I'd believed in for so long that I'd always been told to put my faith in college in the United States, like higher education, um, until every infrastructure cracked, it kind of, kind of failed me. I mean, my college found the boy who had raped me to be innocent, and that meant that I was guilty of lying. Um, 
And so and you talk about I had what, no what more it? reason to stay, you know. What was that like? Um, How tough was that? It was, it was devastating. It was, um, again, I put my faith in a system. I went through the colleges. They call it conflict medi mediation process, um, which in retrospect is absurd, you know, like as if a violent felony could be mediated like a playground fight. Um, but when I was 18, like, this is what they advised me to do. They said you could go to the police, but you have no evidence and you will, you know, nothing will really come of it because you've waited more than 72 hours, so it's too late to perform a rape kit. Um, or you could go through the college's conflict mediation process, or you can do nothing. Those were the three options that were presented to me. And obviously, the first was presented in a very bad light, and doing nothing <laughs> is doing nothing. The rape response coordinator who I went to told me, we will get a conviction and he will be expelled. And again, in retrospect, how absurd that, you know, the punishment, even if this were the case, even if she were, were correct and this were true, that the punishment for sexual assault, a violent felony is just, oh, you have to leave this school. Um, but in fact, that isn't even what happened. Um, so I wrote my testimony, and he wrote his testimony. And I remember um, when the, um, the mediator handed me his testimony, and I read it, um, he did not claim that we had had consensual sex. Um, he simply wrote that we had never had sex. And that absolutely blew my mind. And, um, yeah, and so they found him to be innocent. They allowed him to remain on campus, which really upset me. And I remember the mediator said to me, well, you know, if he's accused of raping another girl, we'll take it really seriously. So they told you How? to go through this process. Yeah. You, you don't get uh, any justice in the process. And they say, well, maybe the next time. Oh, yeah, so when, when he potentially ruins someone else's life, then we'll maybe take it seriously. All these things you've done take tremendous courage um, to speak out, um, to tell your story in the face of people who say you're lying. What do you want to say to other women who either have endured a sexual assault um, and gone through similar things that you've been through? What, what did you want to say with this book to them? This was not your fault. Short shorts don't cause rape. Weed doesn't cause rape. Vodka doesn't cause rape. Rapists cause rape. No one causes rape but rapists. Um, you just have to know that and really know that. Let yourself know that. And any shame you're feeling is misplaced shame. It's not shame on you, shame on him. It's an incredibly powerful story and an important one. And um, it's called Girl in the Woods by Aspen Mattis. Thank you. Thank you so much. We continue our program now with a trip to the city of Detroit. Author David Marinus is known for the research he puts into his work. And in his latest book, he dives into the glory days of Detroit, his hometown. It's called Once in a Great City, a Detroit Story. Although it details Motor City's peak in the 1960s, Marinus says that signs of a decline were already there. I asked him what inspired him to write the book. Well, I wasn't expecting to write a book about Detroit until... Super Bowl Sunday of 2011 when I was in a bar in Midtown Manhattan and during halftime uh, watching uh, the Super Bowl and, and saw the, a commercial. First I saw a uh, highway sign that said Detroit and that made me pay attention and then all of these iconic images of Detroit, the Joe Louis Fist, the great heavyweight champ, uh, the wonderful Diego Rivera murals of Detroit industry and Eminem, uh, the rapper, driving down uh, Woodward Avenue, the main thoroughfare of Detroit, in a black sedan, walking into the glorious Fox Theater, a black gospel choir rising in song, and Eminem pointing to the camera and saying, this is the Motor City. This is what we do. I choked up watching that ad. They were just selling Chryslers. But it meant so much to me deeply because I was born in Detroit. And it got me thinking about what Detroit gave America and how I could write about that. So you, so you focus on the year 1963. Tell us why. This was a period when Detroit was booming. And there are four main uh, themes or threads of the book. 
automobiles, obviously. Detroit is the heart of the world auto industry. Music, uh, Motown, the, the soundtrack of my generation. Uh, the labor movement in America, the United Auto Workers under Walter Ruther was really the heart of the labor movement. And civil rights. Detroit was key to civil rights during that period of the 60s. So that period allowed me to focus intensely on those four themes. I use the metaphor of my work where I set up an oil rig somewhere and dig as deeply as I can. And that period really allowed me to show what Detroit gave America, but also the seeds of its own collapse. Yeah, I mean, this was, I guess, the golden year, one of the golden years for Detroit. But the cracks were beginning even then? Oh, absolutely. Some sociologists at Wayne State University that year issued a report, uh, largely ignored, that said that Detroit was on its way to losing a half million people by the end of the 1960s, and that depopulation of a half million would continue for the foreseeable future, stripping the city of its tax base. Part of it was the auto industry, a one-company town, the auto industry moving away from Detroit. Part of it was the history of racial tension in Detroit and the white flight that followed that and the, the unwitting negative aspects of urban renewal, which blacks in Detroit called Negro removal in that era. And so many different parts of Detroit were already showing the signs of weakness. What happened to the auto industry? What, what did the auto industry, what did the move by the auto industry leave to, to get out of Detroit? What did it do to that city? Well, it was devastating and it was short-sighted in many ways. The, the movement of the auto industry out of Detroit had begun before 1963, really in the 1950s. They started moving to the suburbs, moving plants to, to different cities and states and, and really into the world, but also, more importantly, leaving Detroit emotionally. Um, and that was really the key. And so when I talk to auto executives today, more than a half century later, they all regret that they left behind the heart of Detroit. The, you know, the people that built, built the auto industry were really living in Detroit, and they were sort of left behind uh, to, to sort of to sink or swim, and they, and they sank mostly. Detroit has had a long... Going, ongoing collapse, and, and the, the, the leaving of the auto industry was really the key to that. We've all seen the pictures of that city and uh, the houses that have been abandoned and the damage that's been done by the recession and the auto industry leaving. Um, is Detroit back on a road to recovery or not? You know, I think it is. I'm a, a journalist and historian, so I'm skeptical but optimistic. But since the book came out, I've been to de back to Detroit four times, and every time I've seen more energy. David Marinus, his book is called Once in Great City, A Detroit Story. David, it's good to see you. Thank you very much for being with us. We appreciate it. Thank you, John. And coming up next on our program. Mostly everybody out of there I know for a fact. I would go so far as to say 90% never got paid what they were supposed to. Rock and Roll Hall of Famer Little Anthony tells us the stories behind his biggest hits. But is it? It's really just the beginning, right? Have you written a book and want it published but don't know where to start? You're not alone. Page Publishing cuts through the confusion that most new authors face, like copyright protection, barcodes, printing, and digital uploading. We will get your book into bookstores now. We guide you through the publishing maze and help you distribute and sell your work in hard copy and ebook formats. That's right, we will digitize and place your book for sale on Amazon, Apple iBooks, and Google, offering it to millions. Don't waste another minute. Most publishers won't even look at new author submissions, but we're doing Different. We review your book and provide you feedback in about a week. If we decide to publish your book, your work ends and ours begins. From copy editing and proofing to typesetting and book cover art, our team gets you into bookstores fast. Call for your free author submission kit at 1-800-229-1097. Tomorrow. Oil in the Arctic. We're the eyes and the ears here in the Arctic. We want to be prepared. As the ice recedes and potential danger builds, can science keep a step ahead of disaster? We can't go back if we have a significant accident. The oil will make its way into the ice. Techno's team of experts show you how the miracles of science, this is what innovation looks like, can affect and surprise us. I feel like we're making an impact. Let's do it. Techno, where technology meets humanity. Tomorrow, 5.30 Eastern, only on Al Jazeera America. Tomorrow, the sports story everyone's talking about. I can take a guy with average genetics and I can make him world champion. With drugs, oh, absolutely. 
breaks intriguing and suggestive ground, says the New York Times. Variety calls it an explosive documentary. And the New York Daily News says impressive investigative journalism. As long as they know what the testing procedure is, they'll always be able to beat it. Don't miss the world-exclusive undercover investigation. Tomorrow, 9 Eastern, only on Al Jazeera America. Welcome back. I'm John Sigenthaler, and tonight we continue with Little Anthony. You know his name and his music, a remarkable voice and entertainer. His songs like Tears on My Pillow and Going Out of My Head defined a decade. I talked to him about his new memoir and how he got his nickname. They took the um, record Tears on My Pillow to be played to WINS, WINS wins at that time. a man by the name of Alan Freed. He was a huge disc jockey. And they played it for him. He said, wow, what a beautiful, that's a really great voice for that girl. And that girl can sing. And that guy said, that's not, that's not a girl. That's a guy. He said, well, he must be awfully little. What's his name? And they told him his name's Anthony Gordy. Little Anthony. Little Anthony. Tears on my pillow, in my heart. Tears on my pillow hurt so bad. Going out of my head. Did you ever imagine that those songs that you helped make famous would live for five decades and beyond? Um, that I did, not Tears on My Pillow. Oh, not the others I did earlier. Because I was pretty young and I didn't know. But, but there was something about going out of my head, man. It was something special here. I need you so badly, I can't think of anything. You say in this book that when we were younger, the Imperials and I squandered so much. We yeah. made all the wrong moves, had the wrong managers, mm -hmm. listened to almost no one, were ripped off unknowingly, and got caught up in our own celebrity. Yep. How did that happen? It's the way it was in those days. You got kids out of Brooklyn, None of them are going to be rocket scientists. We didn't have the proper representation. And we weren't unique. Mostly everybody out of there I know for a fact. I would go so far as to say 90% never got paid what they were supposed to. And let me just say, when you read this book, you talk about some things that uh, are, are very personal, mm -hmm. um, not always flattering. No. <laughs> Was that tough to do? Yes. I told the story about my son, uh, Casey. He was a 26-year-old kid that died, and because he got mixed up, with, he, well, it, he played football, and he got, he got injured a lot, and so he started taking the, the, the pain pills and all that kind of stuff. And I remember that he, he had a child, and he tried to hide from Linda and I, my wife, and we found out about it, and the, the little child was about two years old at that point. He said, why are you, what's going on? What is this? You know, and I'm getting on him, trying to be that typical father. I'm going to be very wise. I'm going to show him what, how you do things. And, and I remember he ran up the st stairs, and he turned around to me, and he says, why can't you just love me? Looking back now, I wish I could do it again, but I can't. I can't do it. So there are many stories like that. My, my time with the Civil Rights Movement and being down there at a time when you're 18, I had to go down there and see colored white, this, that. Traveling this. to the South. Yes. You were going through your uh, exciting career when the country was going through a revolution. Yes, absolutely. In civil rights. Right in the middle of it. And you, and you experienced it firsthand. How much was race injected into the careers of young African Americans Big like time. yourself? Big time. You're, you're, you're aware of it. From day one, other cats will tell you what to expect. Shimmy, shimmy, coco bop. It was very difficult for me in the South. It was, I was way out of my element. I go back South today, it's, it's a new South. The same places I went that I felt humiliated, now I'm accepted. The book is called Little Anthony, My Journey my destiny. It's a pleasure to meet you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me, and I can explain myself. That's our program.
Thanks to all the authors who shared their stories. And we'd like to wish everyone a happy holiday. Thanks to you for watching. I'm John Sigenthaler. See you back here next time. Thank you.